Yeah, I can't stand it. <laughs> I just Googled 23 song. I figured it would say 23 in there. That's that's what I... Um, da, 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 da. John EVT with eight months. Hey, Big A, your streak is now older than me. My streak? What do you mean my streak? Also, congratulations on hitting nine or seven years old, seven months old. Michael Jordan could never, could never what exactly? Because all I did was play a country music song. Michael Jordan could never play country music? What are you, what are you saying? Um, hello, Atriac. I'm craving some carbs. Dr. Carbs? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> nice to see you, though. Uh, it's Finn with the four plus three months, seven months. Hey, Big A, I had to design a game for university, and I designed a Metroidvania called Legend of the Coffee Cow. It will have glizzy enemies, don't worry. It will have the enemies, so you haven't designed it yet. You, <laughs> you've thought of the idea and typed it in chat. You haven't actually made the game Legend of the Coffee Cow. He got me. <laughs> Average game designer, bro, on in the internet. Um, Big A, check out Bush Camp Dad. You think I don't know Fortnite, bro? You think I don't know Fortnite? Bush Camp Dad, the mid-40s dad that sits in a bush all day and has a lot of Fortnite wins? I'm aware, bro. I'm fucking... Oh, chat's gone. I was recording something. Oh. Uh, I'm going to bring you back. Three? Guys, wait. Get the paddles. All right, <laughs> they're flatlining. They're flatlining. Bzz, bzz. Clear. Psh. Oh God, they're back. Wait, they're dead again. One more time. Clear. Psh. Oh my God, I saved your life. I saved your fucking life. Uh, I feel like watching all that house has made me an actual doctor. I feel like I could cure somebody. Low key, not even only half joking. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I could figure it out. You know what I'm saying? I could muddle my way through. If someone came in with some symptoms, I could, I could, I mean, all I really got to do is prescribe every possible test and then it, it'll, it'll, uh, yeah, I'll try, I'll try interferon. I'll try fucking steroids. I'll try fucking, um, antibiotics all right and then after that if he's still fucking they're still kicking i did my job and then we go to radiation and then we go to drill uh just prescribe lots of antibiotics and you're already a doctor true antibiotics do carry they do carry medical science i gotta be honest i feel like if doctors were really about that life they would all collectively dump all the antibiotics <laughs> into the ocean and just have to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? Would millions die? Sure. Sure. But at the end, well, we have some real-ass doctors. You know what I'm saying? We have some doctors that really know their shit. Uh, and that'd be worth it for the rest of us. Mock Mike. M-O-C Mike. Thank you for the 10 gifted. Good goddamn. Um... Uh, I watched Rick and Morty and felt like I could create interdimensional travel. Well, you probably could because the IQ level that you had to have to really enjoy that show um, speaks to me and tells me that you are, in the very least, a top 1% scientist. Uh, and you should let people know about that on Reddit. You should let people know that you're a little bit more intelligent than the average bear whenever you're giving a comment so people can know that they shouldn't mess with you. They shouldn't challenge you in any way. Um... Prescribe 800 milligrams of ibuprofen for everybody. That doesn't, that's not going to cure. What if you got like a shark bite? <laughs> um, it's been officially over 48 months of not subbing to your stream. What a streak. <laughs> really? Congratulations. <laughs> Absolutely powerful. 48 months, dude. That's incredible. That is incredible. Two years. So I'll have to more than actually four years. I'm sorry, four years, four years of, of uh, four years. And have you been chatting that whole time? No. <laughs> Wait a minute, bro. You're not even your fake streak is a lie. You haven't been here that long. 
Bro, your first message is this year, I think. No, it's okay. Wait, never mind. Actually, I take it back. Actually, I take it back. You guys is actually really crazy. <laughs> Wait, this is actually really crazy. You messaged, you posted in my chat on May 13th, 2020. One time. And then you didn't post again for three years till November of last year. <laughs> Wait, what? You, why do I, every time I look at someone's chat history, it's something fucking crazy. What was I streaming? Uh, TwitchTracker.com, Atrioc. What was I streaming? Load, 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 load. Okay, streams. Your first message, May 13th, 2020. Well, this website is fucking down. This website is fucking down. Um... I'll find it in a second. Hypothetically, how many ads would someone have to watch for them to make you more money than if they had subbed? Uh, I don't, I have no idea. On a per person level, I don't think it ever adds up. I don't think it would ever work. All right, wait, let me just see. May, May 2020. May 2020. May. This is like the fucking beginning of the pandemic, dude. All right, May 13th, 2020, taking back the world record. I had a thousand. Oh, this is way too high. This must have been. Oh, this is when I did Monkey Ball. Uh, this is when I did the, the Monkey Ball getting over it, maybe. Um,. Yeah, okay. So that was your only stream. And then and then you didn't watch me again until November 27th of last year. <laughs> like a month ago. Two months ago. <laughs> That's so strange. That's so strange. But I don't think that makes you like a four-year, you know, real one. He watched. He was just cooking up the next message. <laughs> Fuck, I lost his username. I want to see what his next message was. I want to see what took him three years to think of. Uh... <laughs> How are y'all doing? What's going on? What's, 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 uh, uh, what's cooking? What's happening? What's vibing? How is your week going thus far? You're all right. I'm doing good, big A. Uh, hey, big guy, I couldn't source any quaaludes. Is Vicodin a good substitution? I think so. I'm not a doctor, but I, you can count me as one. Um, did you hear about the CSU strike? And we talked about it briefly. Uh, I heard it was one day. I heard the CSU strike began and end. So there was a guy in my chat like saying, oh, I'm never going to be able to go back to class. And the strike had started three hours ago and then ended before the next day. <laughs> So you didn't miss any class. You, you you have your full you have a full week of classes. That not not a thing happened for you. Um I got COVID. Sucks. It's not real, but you got it, I guess, somehow. You faked it. I got COVID and it's the busiest week at my work of all time. I'm gonna have to do so much work at home. <sighs> that does suck. Oh, that is like a fucking fiendish reality of uh, work from home plus sickness is they can still like often expect you to do stuff. Um, like you should really take time off. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, I am here to pitch my idea. Big A versus small A. The idea is that you fight small ants, but like dot, dot, dot. That's the whole idea. You mean uh, physically fight small ants? It just feels like I don't have any beef with him. Why would we would, we would hurt each other? <laughs> this has legs. <laughs> uh, we, what if we duel? You know, I feel like if we physically fight as two gamers, nobody's gonna die. And that's not we do this to entertain the chat. They need to have a real gladiator arena. What if we? Pistols at dawn, you know what I'm saying? 
Um, better yet, wait until you have a kid and then fight them. Oh, that's little A, I fight my child? Well, that just doesn't seem very fair. My child will obviously be a uh, giga chat from day one <laughs> who can sleep me. Uh, I I got no beef. I don't want to fight him. Just maybe shoot him. Exactly. I, 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 well, if I shoot him, it's for content. If I fight him, it feels real. But if I shoot him, how was your day? Yeah, it was good. I tried this new thing. Um, you might not even care about this. <laughs> But I did it for my editors. So my editors will message me things and they'll be like, can you do this for me? And then I'll open my Discord DMs and I'll see a bunch of unread DMs. Some of them not even from my editors, from random people. And I'm like, I don't want to read that. And so I won't click it. So what I did today is like, I, I figured out a way around that, which is whenever I'm on my computer, I'll jump in to my editor Discord and just join voice chat. Like I'm fucking waiting for the boys to play games. I just sit there and I'm calling it big A office hours. <laughs> and I sat there for like a long time today. And I'm like, anyone can come in. Anyone can jump in and tell me what the fuck I need to do or what they want from me. And they did it. Five different fucking people all jumped in the call today. And they were like, hey, can you record this voice line for me? Or what do you think I should do on this edit or whatever? And I did. I did all the fucking stuff. And we got it all done. And I did more for them in that day than I probably did in fucking a week of DMs, two weeks of DMs. So I call it a big dub. It was a major win. I'm very happy with this. And it's a good way for me to just be chilling and chat. And also I get to talk to my editors more and they make fun old jokes. Can I tell you a funny joke? It's not even a joke. And it's not so, It's not part of the streak. <laughs> uh, I feel like I can tell this. Uh, let me ask, I guess. Bro, I can tell us. Well, there can't possibly be. Well, <laughs> I'm asking. I'm asking. Wait, pause, champ. 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 If I don't get a response, I'm just gonna tell it. <laughs> it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a fucking deal. I just fucking want to tell a story. Uh. Respond to me, Zinjo! Oh my god, I'm so pissed. I'm telling it. <laughs> Fuck it, dude. What is he gonna. This is such a small thing. All right, Zinjo. Zinjo. What if I call him? What if I call him? Wait, let me call him. Come on. Come on, buddy. Oh my god, I'm getting thrown all my fucking editors. I sit in a call all day for this asshole. I sit in a call, I answer his questions, I record his voiceover. Oh, uh, what's my fucking voiceover line that I said today? Oh, fucking 20 times to get it right. Uh, alone, each of these targets would be a challenge. But to kill all five without being seen and escape? That's an ultimate hitman contract. How will the world's best players solve it to win $1,500? Let's find out. <laughs> So anyway, let me tell you the story. Zinjo is considering, uh, Zinjo currently works, dude, I feel like I'm really telling his life. <laughs> oh God. Okay, I'll change some details. I'll change some details. I'll change some details. I'll change some details because really it is the gist of the story that matters, not the specifics. Okay, Zinjo his address is 561. <laughs> no. He currently works two jobs. One is for me as an editor, and one is at a restaurant. <laughs> okay? He works at a restaurant and as an editor. Okay? So this is his two jobs. All right? He has worked there for a while. And today, <laughs> or really recently, he comes and he's like, yeah, I think I'm quitting and I'd like to do, uh, you know, editing more full time, like really get into it. And I'm like, that's badass. You're a great editor. I'd love to work with you more. You're killing it on this Hitman project. Uh, why leave the restaurant? You said you always wanted to have like this, you know, in-person type of thing for your job. And he goes, <laughs> yeah, so I found out the owner's a Nazi. <laughs> 
And he's like, I should have known when I looked at the name of the restaurant right before I was hired. They changed it. And it... <laughs> Like, yeah, I just thought they liked warm or beer. Yeah, there's like warm beer all over the place. Uh, uh, but then I realized, no, they're just bad people and I'm quitting. That's crazy to me. That's crazy, dude. Uh, so I didn't even know there were any Australian Nazis. But there you have it, dude. It's like fucking, that's fucking crazy. Um... Damn, Chick-fil-A really went downhill, huh? Below, I work at a place that digitizes old slides and shit. And last week, a guy brought in a bunch of slides from a KKK book burning in the 80s. He brought in slides to be digitized he wants to keep his fucking kkk book burning album on the cloud <laughs> that's fucking crazy that's fucking crazy and he, he just thought that was normal he like brought that in it was like i can you that's that's wild uh when I was an undergrad, I organized a book sale of some dead professor's books, and one of them was straight up Nazi erotica. You guys, that's there's that's just crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. Uh, you guys have some connections, huh? Some insane connections. When I was in college uh, in 2015, um. I got a MAGA hat, okay? <laughs> I love that fashion choice. And ended up on Trump's mailing list. I just got an email from the Trump campaign. Oh, he said, I regret that. I just got an email from the Trump campaign that said, he will always love me. <laughs> Can you send me a screenshot? Wait, Rocker Boy, I'm whispering you. I'm whispering you. Can you send me a screenshot of this email? He will always love you? That's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, you're in, dude. You're in. You're in with the dawn. How awesome is that? Uh, I was clearing out my dad's uncle's house, and we found a certificate telling us he was a druid. <laughs> a druid? Like, talks to animals, can turn into a bear? Uh, Ishrock, um... My hot water is broken. Can you hype me up for a cold shower? <laughs> yes, actually, I can. You know what I can do is there's this really fucking funny account. Uh, damn, where is this guy? I think I just liked it. Uh, this is so... Where is this guy? <laughs> He's a hoot, dude. He's a hoot and a half. Oh, man. I'm probably not. Oh, here it is. 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 <laughs> it's this guy, Hunter. <laughs> and all he talks about is how he's a cold caller hustler. Uh, <laughs> and that cold showers are the way to success. So he calls the hot water the loser zone <laughs> and the cold water the success zone. <laughs> I'll be in New York City next Friday to close some massive deals. Who should I meet with to discuss cold showers? <laughs> this is the perfect office. <laughs> it's like a bed in your cubicle. <laughs> uh, but this one was funny. I'm done with dating. I meet a girl. I take her out. I ask about her dad's business, what his 2024 budget is for business to business software as a service tools, who decision making our <laughs> decision makers are, who hours of the problem is, and what the time was for building a solution. She ghosts me. It starts over again. The cycle everyone's been through, dude. Uh, I just got a $3,000 bonus for Q4. Can't decide how I want to spend it. Either airfare first class to Cabo for my sales manager and his wife. 
or surprise my sales manager with tickets to the Super Bowl for him and a friend. What do you think? <laughs> uh, my boss just offered me a 25K per year raise. I thought about the offer for a moment, but then I thought about the shareholders and I declined the offer. I can't take money out of people's pockets when I haven't done anything to earn it. So true, bro. So fucking true. Uh, what a goat, dude. So anyway, that's what... You just be like that guy. Take your cold shower. Um, finally, someone thinking about the poor shareholders. For real, though. For real, for real. These poor fucking shareholders. Um, H-Rock, you should go to the Super Bowl and take me. Sounds like you just want me to be sort of a pay pig for you to go to the Super Bowl. I don't even think you want to go with me. I feel like you'd rather go with somebody who likes football. <laughs> uh... Chat field trip. All right. Who in chat wants me to buy them tickets to the Super Bowl? We'll all go, okay? Uh, we'll do a chat field trip. Okay, so what I need, like 30 tickets, 40 tickets, 50 tickets. Oh, this is going to be, this is going to be a hassle. Uh, can I fly you there? Yes, of course. I'll also pay for the flights. Uh, wait, we got the image. <laughs> Dude, he wasn't joking. He legitimately, wait, you dox yourself, bro. I got, <laughs> wow. I have to be the adult here. I got, I have to stop you from getting doxed. Holy shit, I would be well within my rights after you send me this image to just show your full fucking email. But I'm gonna cut it. Uh, here, that doesn't show your email anymore. Uh, Donald J. Trump email. I'll never stop loving you. <laughs> Such a fucking cold opening line to fucking ask for money. Woo! I'll never stop. It's like the beginning of a fucking like Napoleon poetry to his wife. Uh, you stuck by me every single time the radical left tried to kick me down. This is President Trump, and I'll never stop loving you. Why? Because you've always loved me. <laughs> it's kind of conditional. Uh, you stuck by... Yeah, I remember that. Wait, you said it twice. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> you stuck by me every single time the radical left tried to kick me down. We know that. You said it two sentences ago. Uh... <laughs> Oh, I dox myself, bro. <laughs> that's fucking bad. <laughs> Thankfully, that's my fucking spam email. Um, bro, come to AZ. I have... Wait, sorry, what? Anyway, what did he say? He said, he said um, even when they took my mug shot, I felt your love even when they raided my home. I guess that is a fact. Um... Doo -doo 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 so it'll cost me $14 million to give everybody tickets. But you don't, are those, you said you got average tickets? I want good tickets. If you're an HROC chatter, you shouldn't be sitting in the nosebleeds, bro. I want like courtside, not courtside, <laughs> whatever. You know, I want as close as you can get. All right, I want I want to be right there. Um, field side, if you will. I, I Ideally, you guys are hanging out in like the the Taylor Swift suite, you know? Um, not field side on the field. You guys want to play? It's going to be, I don't know how much it would cost for me to buy one of the teams or both of the teams and have them replace the players with you for the Super Bowl. Uh, it's possible with enough money, we can get the halftime show replaced with Drop Spindle and Ask. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's going to cost me quite a bit. That's not going to uh, need NVIDIA to go up. Dude, I can't ask more out of NVIDIA. I can't ask more from Jensen Huang. He has given me so much. He's my guardian angel. He watches over me. He smiles with his leather jacket, and he gives and he gives. For whatever reason, this fucking stock doesn't stop going up. Despite the fact that, like, I don't know, I just, it just doesn't, it's so richly valued. Um, 
Um, it is his fiduciary duty to make the line go up. Don't thank him. Well, it's every CEO's fiduciary duty, but he's the only one that actually does it. You know what I'm saying? He gets the job done. But for that, I salute him. Um, it is partially because Mark Zuckerberg openly said, hey, we're going to buy, what do you say, like 350 million <laughs> NVIDIA chips or something? Zuck says he'll buy NVIDIA. What was it? He's like... Yeah, 350,000 of the H100 NVIDIA AI GPUs. Each one of those costs 25 grand. <laughs> and he just said it. He's like, yeah, we're going to buy 350,000 of them. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> once you have that, that's pretty, the market likes to hear that. That's that indicates demand for your products. And he said NVIDIA too. He didn't say we're going to buy GPU power. He said we're going to buy NVIDIA H100 graphics cards. Um, he's going to feed them to his cows. <laughs> Dude, he is. He's buying them to feed it to his cows so he gets better tasting fucking beef. Holy shit. Uh... You never mentioned what kind of heater of a message I was cooking up? Oh, yeah. So if you guys don't know, at the beginning of the stream, incoming callers came in and said, I, well, we found out his chat history, and it turns out he made one message in 2020 and then didn't speak for three years. And I always wanted to know, what was he cooking up for that three years? Here's what it was. Again, uh, his message in May of 2020 was a spamming of the Ludwig pride emote, which is Ludwig's ass with a rainbow on it. And that was it, that's what he did. Then three years later, he comes back to the stream and he says, <clears throat> hey, Big A, I thought you'd wanna know I'm playing LOL right now. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Zinjo! Uh... Uh, I have to deafen. Wait, I actually need to uh, streamer mode. It's too loud. Um, uh, refresh. What do you mean refresh? Are the stream dying? Holy God damn it. We're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. Is it even spectrum? Bro, sometimes you guys get weird apps because I don't even, I used to get like the, uh, Whatchamacallit, the red line. Is that your Discord going off? It's probably your guys' Discord going off, really. Uh, it's news. We're Barack, we're Barack Obama, dude. And we're drone striking our way to victory. Uh, honestly, I'm gonna tell you something. I think Obama gets overhated for drone strikes and underhated for bending over backwards to corporations. I actually think the drone strikes, while not good, he wasn't more than everyone since. He was just there for the evolution of drone technology. But they haven't like it's not like it's not like it's not like there's this big spike in drones with Obama and it goes down. It's like it goes up and stays there. <laughs> so it's like I mean he could have he could have fought against it, but like he gets all of the drone strike hate when it's like we're drone striking right now, bro. Uh you know, Bush would have drone struck if he, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, I don't think, I think it's like, people make it out like Obama was walking around the White House on the phone like, you better be drone striking. Anyone, anytime they're like, hey, should we use a human for this? Or should we maybe not do this? He was like, no, you better drone strike. I don't, I think he just, I think he just went with the military suggestions and they did drone strikes. What I think, you know, people don't talk about enough is that like, uh, <laughs> he, completely bent over to Wall Street, completely did not like do anything to um uh any antitrust, none of that. Like it was it was all that was like stuff that you find out more about if you look into it, where it's like, man, it's, there was like opportunity to do that stuff and he just didn't do it. Um that was the fastest shower of my life. Thank you for the inspiration. You finished your cold shower. You really you really want to soak in it, you know? 
Uh, didn't Trump drone strike more? All I'm saying is like, I, I haven't counted the drone strikes. <laughs> But all I know is I'm aware that like people talk about it like it's a big spike that goes down. And it's just, it's like the rise of drones. It, it just happened during his presidency. And so I, uh, um, oh, but oh, but oh, but oh, but oh, but oh, but oh. Weed, Slipknot, and an Atriox stream, the best night of the week. Are you playing Slipknot over my stream. Because <laughs> uh, I'll save you the time, brother. All right, we cleared out the VOD frogs. <laughs> we cleared them out, bro. Now it's all, it's soothing. Yeah, you could just get a cup of tea, relax, play some Slipknot, read a book maybe. Uh, Rars, thank you for the uh, 28 months. Moo, moo, here's my Subaru. Subaru for sub, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Bars. Uh, Jerome, thank you for the 11 months. Soul to sex, thank you for the prime. Rector Javaro, they give it six months. Here's to a happy Valentine's Day, Big A. It's not Valentine's Day. I mean, I guess it's coming up, but you have time. Rolling in Bucks, they give it seven months. Ram, Remindib, Remidiba, they give it the gifties, five gifties. Appreciate that. RDA, they give it the eight months. Big A, if a box of everything you've lost in life randomly appeared and you could save one thing, what would you pick? Interesting. Something I've lost. Mm, his hair. <laughs> for real, for real, for real, for real. Um, I don't know. What's the non-serious answer? I'm trying to think of something just fun that I've lost. Oh, I can't think of anything. I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to think of something where I like I lost it and I was pissed about it. I mean, um not anymore, but you know, I've definitely lost a wallet and it's fucking pissed me off and I lost a bunch of shit. Uh virginity? I haven't lost my virginity. <laughs> Why would I ever lose that? I keep a keep it under tight guard. Uh League hours? You want me to pull league hours out of a box? Um, well, then I, the thing is, the problem is, if I were to uh, uh, redo my life and not play league, I would obviously be a um, professional NBA player. <laughs> so I wouldn't be streaming. So you guys, we, we, didn't have this, we wouldn't have this going. Like, if I had not played League of Legends, I would be uh, high-fiving LeBron now. Uh, and fucking dunking in the NBA. So it's just not, it's not uh, what could have been. I, I mean, that would be fine, but it's not as cool as what I'm doing now. Uh, uh, Atrock, I think the last time you were that mad at something on stream was when you thought you left your wallet at the movie theaters during Spider-Man. I don't even remember that. I do remember when... There was that shooting when I saw the movie Nope and the fucking police like had helicopters over the theater and we had to run out of there and I left my wallet and I didn't get it back and that was fucking shitty. Uh, that sucked. <laughs> I do remember. And the shooting, yeah. America is a crazy place. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> that was crazy. Yeah, we were. It was me and uh, Stans and and Ari and Rochelle double date, and we were seeing Nope. And then halfway through the movie, the fucking picture stops. Like the theater just stops playing, and everyone's kind of sitting there giggling, and they're like, "Whoa, what's going on? This theater sucks. What's going on?" And then somebody in the back of the theater is like, "Let me check it out." And then they they stand up again. It's dark in the room. Everyone's giggling, having a good time, but it's kind of quiet. And the person in the back stands up, goes to the, the big double doors in the back, opens them to like look into the lobby of the theater. 
and all you hear is get out get out and then everybody in the theater fucking panics it's it goes from like quiet nervousness to complete chaos everyone starts rushing for the exits uh, and as we rush outside fire exits you know like whatever in the front of the theater you see helicopters over there. apparently there was a there was shots fired somewhere near the theater and someone had called the police and they were all here responding to a shooting. Uh, but no, turns out there was no actual shooting in the theater. Uh, bet you must have thought, nope. Good one. <laughs> Good one, bro. Uh, I saw... Um, Big A, how do you deal with so much bad slash scary news nowadays? What I do is, if it's a real life fail, I call it a win. <laughs> Little mental trick. That way I turn all of the negatives into positives. Um, I don't know. It, I, I do think um, things are extra crazy, but also think like, realistically, there's many, many, many years in history where things have been very crazy. Maybe we just don't see it as much. We have deluge of news access. Uh, just, you know, remember that there's things you control and things you can't, and don't worry too much about things you can't control because it's not going to change anything. Uh, I was at the State Fair of Texas this year when someone started shooting in the food court. We're talking about our, our, our shooting examples, all right? We get that enough in America. Uh, Big A, uh, is it just me or is Big A looking high as fuck? This dude is stoned, dude. Believe me, I know. Uh, no, I'm not high. <laughs> I'm not suited. I'm not high. Never high. Whatever you guys say. Never. Not once. Um, I had a photography class in college. There was a different kind of shooting there. I'm going to time you out <laughs> for the worst fucking pun that I've heard in a minute, dude. I will see you in 10 minutes. I will see you. What do you think on that, bro? Um... Bro, how many weeds did you smoke? Dude, I had so many weeds. I was just fucking toking the devil's lettuce. Uh, I just joined and I got two ads before joining the stream. Not three seconds later, I got four ads. How is there no cooldown? Twitch, I guess. Uh, they fired people. I don't know if you noticed. The revenue's trying to go up. I wish, dude, if one thing I wish you could fucking disable as a streamer is, is, um, the one someone get when they first join. I think that's so stupid. <laughs> I think it's so stupid. It, it like, it, it dramatically increases, uh, yeah, pre-roll ads. Pre-roll ads uh, are, it fucks discovery. It fucks um, switching costs, increased switching costs. It's bad for the streamer. Like for the streamer, obviously, if I run a fucking mid-roll ad when I'm waiting for house, I get money and I love money. What's that's great. <laughs> I'm not gonna argue with that. It's a win-win, Twitch. But when you pre-roll ad me, you get money and I get dick. I don't get shit because you bounce my viewer. Uh uh. Aren't you already disabled your pre-rolls by running mid-rolls? That's what you'd think, right? I don't know how it fucking works. I just assumed I just want one setting where it's like pre-rolls. Mid-rolls, and I could turn mid-rolls on and pre-rolls off. Um, it's rock. I was at my six-year anniversary uh, dinner with my girlfriend, but I turned your stream on under the table. <laughs> Are you at your anniversary dinner right now? Awesome. Good. Maximize your time. She's going to respect that. She's going to respect that more because you're not wasting a moment. You're optimizing every second to learn. Okay. Um, dude, big A. Um, why don't you just take out an ad on Twitch that has it literally be a video of a normal stream so no one can tell the difference? What do you mean no one can tell the difference? If, if someone clicks on XQC stream and gets an ad of me just fucking playing Paper Mario... <laughs> They're not going to be able to tell the difference. Yeah, they will. They'll wonder what's going on. If anything, people get so pissed. If any of the Twitch ads feature another streamer, Twitch streamers get extra pissed. This happened when I was working there. 
Um, but it also happened again with Ninja at one point. They were like putting Ninja in ads and playing on other Fortnite streamers' channels, and they were getting fucking pissed. Um, they don't like it. That it feels it's like soliciting. Um, they don't care if it's a dumb Reese's Pieces ad or whatever, but if it's got another streamer. Uh, spill the tea. That was the tea. It was Ninja. I don't remember what happened back whenever I was doing it. I remember it was like Dan's Gaming and Co Carnage and those guys were extra pissed because I think they was playing Jericho. These are all old names, bro. I don't remember. I think it was Jericho in an ad and they were pissed. Um, but I, I don't, I, it's so vague. I mean, or maybe it was, uh, what was his name? Gold Glove. Was Dan's Gaming a real person? He is a real person. He still streams. In October, he gets fucking massive viewership, like 15K, I think. He's got the the goaded Halloween streams. Uh, do, 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 do. Dan, I remember Gold Glove. Gold Glove's the homie. I remember I did this show called Twitch Weekly, um, which I thought nobody ever I, people watched it but i didn't think any streamers watched it and then i went to a um twitch party at like pax or something and jerick not jerick gold glove walked up to me and goes hey are you brandon <laughs> and i'm like wait how the fuck do you know who i am <laughs> we're working on your fucking like you're he was a you know he's like the big guy at the show and he's like yeah i saw you on twitch weekly and i thought that was fucking sick i was like that was dope he was really nice. He was super nice to me. Uh, so I, as far as I'm concerned, he's great. Uh, Itchrock, I saw your interview with Toby Fox. Kind of crazy how it took you four years to play Undertale after meeting him. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know what the fuck Undertale was right today. <laughs> when I did the interview with Toby Fox, which is like one of his only interviews ever, I thought, who is this guy? <laughs> I remember thinking, we just talk about Smash? Like, what are we doing? We're talking about this fucking... Uh, and then later I realized how valuable... Um, I realized how valuable and important he was to gaming. Uh, you've interviewed Toby Fox? That I have. That I have. Um, uh, did I, I remember I asked him, like, so... Um, <laughs> I think I asked him something stupid. I was like, did you like working on the music? <laughs> Some shit like that, dude. I don't know. And then, uh, did he? I think so. I think so, bro. I feel like he did. And then I was like waiting for my turn to speak. So I fucking pitched him on my own idea, which was called Storm Heroes, <laughs> which is a... Uh, Teen Titans type show About five teens With the power of different storms So like there's Firestorm And Tornado And Hurricane And um, Cyclone And they all have these names of storms <laughs> It was really Sandstorm It was sick It was really sick And like we had art. Let me see. This existed. Storm Heroes. Oh, God. Dude, I remember. I was talking with Tove about this. We came up with this fucking great thing, Storm Heroes. And then, like, one year later, Blizzard makes Heroes of the Storm and ruins our SEO. <laughs> uh, fuck us. Here it is. Someone made an unofficial Storm Heroes subreddit. <laughs> Five years later, the idea still holds up. It would be a classic. This is three years ago. So we're eight years out. <laughs> uh, remember talking about Storm Heroes to Atroik at over a year ago at PAX South. Is the dream over? <laughs> R.I.P. Storm Heroes. R.I.P. Oh, shit. Just here to say I told you so. I told everyone Storm Heroes would never become a thing. And now look around. There hasn't been a single post in a whole month eight years ago. Bitch. What about this post? Six years. Six years. What a hater, dude. Hater to fake. 
Um, let's see. There's art all time. Look at this. First episode confirmed forecast, <laughs> which is honestly a dope title. First episode of Storm Heroes forecast. It's fucking incredible. Uh, here's the concept art, dude. Look at this. Storm Heroes. Firestorm, thunderstorm, hurricane, tornado, blizzard, sandstorm. They all have their own personalities. Okay? How sick is this, dude? Uh, Darude, that's his favorite song. Mm, the black guy is electric. Yeah, I did fall into the trope. <laughs> the black guy is uh, electric power and nerd. Which turns out is a very common trope that I unwittingly fell into. Uh, but Sandstorm, buff Asian guy. How about that? All right, that's progressive. Hurricane's Latina, and she's the main character. So, uh, <clears throat> do you have Blizzard's number? <laughs> Call him Darude. I'm not going to call him Darude, all right? We're not going to make it. It's just, it's a dream. The dream is dead. Dude, even more fan art. Wait, look at this. I didn't even think I see this. Look at this. It's incredible. Okay, can you imagine? Storm Heroes, bro. The dream is truly... Anyway, if you want to hear more about Storm Heroes, you can uh, watch me tell it to Toby Fox, creator of Undertale. <laughs> on one of his rare public appearances and interviews. You can find that on YouTube. That is uh, a real thing that exists. Um, he never did an interview after that. <laughs> it's because it couldn't be topped. You understand? It couldn't be taught. Once you make an interview that good, it's like wait, no one else. Everyone else is going to ask him boring ass questions. I'm not even going to pitch him. Uh, I think I literally in the interview ask him if he wants to make Storm Heroes as his next game. <laughs> I'm not even fucking kidding. I'm not 100% on that. But I think I think I did do that. Um, that's very Nathan Fielder of you. Well, I get it done. Is all I'm saying. I get it done. Uh, Delta Rune is close enough. He probably hasn't had time for interviews because he's working on it still. Uh, so assuredly, fucking assuredly, Toby Fox is working hard on Storm Heroes. The only thing is, I bet he's gonna come out with it and not give credit. <laughs> I bet in two weeks, Storm Heroes is going to come out. It's going to be a fucking smash hit. Sell 40 million copies. And then uh, he's going to be like, this is my new idea that I thought of. The H-Bomber guy video will be fire, though. <laughs> uh, Storm Heroes, bro. What a dream. Storm Heroes game of the year. Big A, what's your take on Pow World Discourse? I've already talked about it like 50 times, bro. There's like 50 fucking times. I think we made a clip about it. We did a whole thing. Uh, for someone who doesn't watch anime, a -Truck likes to make sure likes to make up fake animes. I guess I do. Maybe I'm just a dreamer, you know? Is that so crazy? Is that such a crime? To be a dreamer in a world of gray, to have a spark of, of hope, of color? Uh, um, he's a closet weeb dude I, I am not a closet weeb <laughs> I'm just not a weeb I never watched any of the ones you guys suggested and I probably should have I remember we did a whole anime ranking stream where you guys suggested like 40 animes for me to watch and I was like maybe I'll watch this one this one this one this one I didn't watch any of them <laughs> I didn't watch one of them not, I didn't watch Tech on Titan I didn't watch Jizu Kaisen. I didn't watch fucking One Piece. I didn't watch nothing. Uh, Vinland Saga. I didn't. I didn't, I watched Cyberpunk, which I loved, but I already that was why the stream happened. And I watched. Uh, I watched Brotherhood. Loved it. 
Cowboy Bebop. Okay, how about that? How about real boomers rise up and we're talking about Cowboy Bebop? That was great. You will like Attack on Titan if Red Rising is your favorite series. I don't know if Red Rising is my favorite series. Red Rising is a book that I really like and recommend. But, oh, Detective Conan. Dude, I actually would love to do that. I just need chat to fucking collectively not be fucking spoiling ass cheating Andes. One, Detective Conan is a show, um, an anime that has like fucking 30,000 episodes. And each one is a self-contained murder mystery that they solve by the end, like a mini Knives Out episode. And uh, I have done a drinking game with Toph and other people at Smash events where we put on Detective Conan and we all try to guess who the killer is or what it is and then we take a shot when you're wrong. So fun, so fun. And the show's great. And it's like, you can just, Gunner TV Live! Thank you for the raid. Um, case closed theme. I wonder if I could use this as my intro. Oh, I bet it's DMCA. Such a tragedy. This is a fucking, this is a banger intro. Spec right, if you decide to watch it on stream. Yeah, I guess I would just be worried about people that like look it up and then spam the chat and are assholes, which is like, oh, people ruin everything. You could rewatch episodes but pretend it's your first time. I, I have seen such a small percentage of the thousand plus episodes that I would just watch new ones every time. I, I would honestly guess. Uh, Galen Jader, thank you for the uh, 32 months. Mehesh, thank you for the 18 months. Hey, H Rock, glizzy, glizzy, glizzy. Short, 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 glizzy, glizzy, glizzy. He doesn't miss. 18 months, he doesn't miss. He gets it. He just gets what good comedy is. Dunga Bunga, thank you for the 32 months. My father is in the hospital and his doctor's name is House. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Uh, that is, that's, that is a, that's Jover. That is a Jover moment. Uh, sevens. He, I guess he will get better eventually. Uh, but you're going to have some rough days. If, if he ever tries to pawn you off to another doctor named Foreman, <laughs> run. Uh, Solotl, thank you for the uh, 10 months. Your most loyal viewer is here. Moo, moo, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you get it. <laughs> this guy gets it. On to flow. Thank you for the five months. Um, D D Caleb. Thank you for the uh, the uh, eight months. Uh, Bloody Rage. Thank you for the twenty six months. Sid Bardo with the tier one. Matt Graves with the prime. Torbjorn Main. Thank you for the eight months. Uh, and Dave. Thank you for the uh, twenty. Uh, the no, I'm sorry, six months at tier one. Um. What's the murder mystery show called? It's called Detective Conan or Case Closed. Are you going to play Prince of Persia tonight? I don't know. Do you think I could beat one boss in Prince of Persia? I kind of just want to... Uh, well, actually... I, I want to watch House at 10 p.m. But if I'm close to a boss, then I would play it and make a little progress, and that could be good. Or... We could um, see if mayhaps there's any interesting uh, videos to watch or look at or any news to discuss. Uh, I don't know. Um, watch a baseball doesn't exist video. The new baseball doesn't exist is nuts. Yeah, but I hear it's too long. I think it's too long, bro. Dallas, bro. How Japan took over baseball. That's a very interesting concept, don't get me wrong. But it's an hour long. Maybe baseball does exist. I can't watch an hour of baseball, bro. And that's weird because his normal videos are way shorter. I'm telling you, dude, every YouTuber is seeing the... They're trying out the hour plus videos. Because there's crazy money in it from TV watchers and third monitor watchers. <laughs> uh, but we're not doing that. We're, I'm watching it live. So I can't. Uh, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to watch an hour long baseball video live. Um, the pathetic economy of the Roman Empire. Is this based? 
or is it cringe? 15 minutes? The pathetic economy of the Roman Empire. Um, I guess that could be fine. But I, I mean, I assume it's probably just comparing the economy of an ancient empire to the empire of today and being like, they're poor. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but comparatively, they were rich. Um, there's a new donkey bid. Donkey. How to get a gun in Pokemon with guns. Is this one of the... There's two kinds of donkey videos. One where he's making a point, and I love those. And then one where he's just got highlight clips and he's giggling over them. <laughs> or not giggling, but like, it's like, it's just not, like a little glitch will happen. Uh, he's making a point, says Ask the Storyteller. <laughs> um, it's poignant. Kind of both. <laughs> he's saying the game is dog. Um, all right, well, it's short. Let's just check it out. Let's see. Let's see if we can learn it here, too. Welcome, pal, world family. Everybody's calling this game Pokemon with guns. So today, I'm going to show you how to get the guns in Pokemon with guns. All right, let's start a new game. And I'm going to call it Gun Gun Island. Okay. Get you the guns faster if you do it like this. I'm going to import my character from Street Fighter 6. There we go. Now, these are called pals. These are not Pokemon or Digimon. Pal World family doesn't like it when you, when you call our Pokemon. <laughs> I mean, the Pals Pokemon. Okay, now this is the uh, this is the Nintendo Switch from Breath of the Wild. Yep. Okay, now the Sheikah Slate. What you're going to want to do is when you're in the windswept hills, is you're going to want to come down here. You're going to want to get the Fortnite. <laughs> there we go. Can we get a chug juice? <laughs> Damn, red. Okay, there's the tree from Dragon Quest XI. All right. Elden Ring. Okay, now first we have to build the workbench. Now open the technology screen and unlock the PAL sphere. Now let's craft the PAL sphere. But we need more palladium and stone first. Oh, this is really stone with your Valheim pilled, huh? Here's some palladium. Now let's farm this real quick. Okay, research the PAL box. Oh, it's too quiet? You can't hear? Mobby, 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 mobby. The wooden structure set. Craft a Pokeball. I mean a PAL sphere. Now we have to catch our first Pokemon. I mean, pal. So this is how you get the Pokemon. Start punching them in the head. All right. Love that. There we go. Really just wail on him. Just keep punching him. Yep. And then when he's almost out of health, then you throw the Pokeball at his head. Okay. The, the pal ball. <laughs> and there it is. Come on. How about Got that? Got our first Pokemon. Okay, Land Ball's dead. You can uh, kick its corpse around if you like. <laughs> All right, so let's craft the wooden club. This is gonna let us club Pokemon easier. Yeah, Love we're gonna that. need a stone pickaxe and a is stone. Is there a lot of crafting in this game? So we're gonna need a lot of stone. Start hitting this stone with your club. We gotta refill our stamina. We ran out of stamina from hitting too many rocks. Okay, build a pickaxe. And, oh, we need more wood for the stone axe. Okay, we got enough wood now. All right. The stone axe. Okay, now we can build the pal box if we get more wood and stone. Thankfully, we have the pickaxe now, so gathering stone is slightly faster. Start hitting this with the axe. It's like arc three. Now we can build okay. a base. We can have lamb ball. So, Here's our first worker. Get to is there like an end game of like really big monsters to fight? Or is it like once you build enough crafting, you get too strong? There's bosses? Okay. Work, Lamb Ball. Don't want to have to hit you with this. Now you have to remember to eat food like Metal Gear Survive, which is one of the best games. Now we have to build a bed, but we don't have enough wood, so we're going to have to get a little more wood. We're actually going to have to build... I, I think I get his point, but this is kind of just a tutorial, right? <laughs> it's like He's legitimately going step by step on how he gets a gun in, in Power World. Uh... Bro, you're so zoomer pilled. It's nine minutes. I'm not zoomer pilled. I just don't want to watch it. <laughs> you understand? I'm like, like what? I, you know, every minute counts. I, I just wanted. Uh, uh, this guy is about. His point is boring, and but like I get the point. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? I I figured out the point so fast that I don't want to watch the rest. 
you wouldn't be this bored if Hugh Laurie did the tutorial. I don't think I'd watch nine minutes of Hugh Laurie playing Power World. Maybe I would, actually. Um... Film Rise. Wait, did you just linked me a fucking nine hour beyond belief? I don't I don't want that. <laughs> uh watch this Skillshare video. Skillshare this? Skillshare. YouTubers sold out to Skillshare, the truth. Um I <laughs> I gotta be honest with you. I, I'm not a hundred percent confident, but in my mind, Skillshare is like one of the least offensive or bad sponsors you could take as a YouTuber. <laughs> what? Ha. This feels like complete uh, <laughs> clickbait. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, this is a 13 minute video. And I, I, this is not Johnny Harris, though. It's not his video. This is logically answered. Um, and I can, the description says, the reality is Skillshare isn't all it's hyped up to be. In most cases, you'll actually find more content on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, bro. If you want to learn something, then we all know you can find somebody with 18 viewers on YouTube that actually teaches it. But like, I don't. that doesn't seem so bad. That's not the dark side of Skillshare. 2.7 million views. They really got it. Feels, this feels completely fake, fake drama. Um, very poignant uh, video about how Big Bird works. Did you hear about the 5 billion 10 year Netflix world, uh, WWE deal? I did. I also saw The Rock got the rights to the name The Rock back. He's now on the board of directors of TKO, which owns uh, WWE and MMA, and he owns the name The Rock, uh, which he got back from his early days. Um, so big moment for Rock fans. Big, it's a short video that's literally life changing. Really. Football thumbnails, but not clickbait. <laughs> I don't understand. It is short, so I will watch it. I will watch this full video. We're gonna have to watch it. You have to watch it with me. <laughs> okay, it looks like they found the clickbait fake football thumbnails and are making them real, which is kind of based. <laughs> What? That was clickbait? Ronaldo with a fucking third leg hog?
He wanted it. All right, great. Perfect. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, video about profiting from homelessness. I feel like we already watched one poignant, serious video. You know what I'm saying? So now we need a goofy one. I hate to follow up that serious expose on soccer to with your, we need like a, we got to balance this out. Um, <laughs> your car will never drive you around. This video is about, this is a two weeks ago video about how we'll never have self-driving. I don't want to watch that. I definitely want self-driving. <laughs> I'm going to will it into existence, bro. I'm not going to watch your 25 minute video disproving it. I want self-driving bad so I can take a nap when I drive places. Do you understand? Are you guys following me? Is anyone getting it? I would like to get into a car and take a nap. Um... Short video on Jewel marketing to kids on Nickelodeon? Wait, For what? over three years, Jewel... Jewel did this? I knew they had, like, childlike marketing. But I don't think they ever... ...was getting millions of kids and teens hooked on nicotine. From buying advertising on kid websites like Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network, to using marketing tactics in the exact same fashion as big tobacco companies, yeah, Jewel was racking in billions of dollars while igniting a public health epidemic. While Jewel denies these claims, there are loads upon loads of documents that tell a completely different story. And today, I'm going to be covering every detail, including every single way Jewel was getting kids to start vaping, and how they managed to spark a major health crisis among kids and teenagers alike my only worry is this is this video just um the jewel documentary on netflix but illuminati because <laughs> i watched that documentary and i already recognize everything that i've seen so far <laughs> uh it could be new i'm just i'm worried that this is just exactly that so i'm gonna skip it again we're, i guess we're getting a lot of skips today i'm sorry that i'm being picky today okay i'm being a picky peter um uh, i'm being a picky peter and i don't want to be all right i want to watch something vibing that we can all enjoy um And then I want to watch House. This is about Melee. Watch this. Everyone knows Marth's huge grab and why it's completely fine. I think that's very interesting to me, but not everybody in chat plays Melee. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's interesting. Everyone I knows. I don't want to expose everyone to watching about Marth's Brad. Mar Marth's grab. Something weird. To oh, it's J Japan. Just to wait, 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 wait. This is interesting. Okay, we're going to watch this. We're gonna watch uh, Economics Explained. Something weird is happening in Japan. Let's find out. Just two decades ago, Japan was the second largest economy in the world. And a decade before that, economists were busy making predictions about when it could even exceed the economic dominance of the USA. Of course, that never happened. And mm -hmm. since the start of the 1990s, Japan's output has been most- I talked about this on stream, I think, but if you, it's funny if you go back and watch like, uh, go back and watch um this hello in here please hey he's a big ass all right all right needles ha. here's my card scan it I'm in. We watched, we watched this Thanks, one time bye. before. I'll see you at the plant tomorrow. This is uh, Back to the Future 2 set in the future. So this is how they thought the future would be in the 80s, okay? This is the 80s vision of what, like, 2020 looks like. Or 2015 looks like. McFly! <laughs> Fujitsu-san, konnichiwa! McFly! I was monitoring that scan you just interfaced. You are terminated! 
No, it wasn't my fault, sir. It was Needles. Needles was behind and the whole you thing. you cooperated. No, I didn't. Uh... And it's him wearing a double Rising Sun tie. And all of his, the companies are owned by Japan. Which is... <laughs> It's just the way, you know, the way it was trending in the 80s was that Japan was fucking unstoppable. That that people needed to learn Japanese. Because, I mean, at that time, all their companies, they had like they had like six companies in the top 10 companies in the world. Uh, and then they had their huge real estate bubble collapse and it changed everything. Um, mostly stagnant. It has since been massively surpassed. Happened right here, right here, 1991. <laughs> Basically right when I was born, by the way. Did I somehow bring doom to Japan? Uh, could something similar happen to China? Yeah, absolutely. I do think Japan is the closest analog to what's going on with the real estate problem in China. Uh, where it's going to lead to some, it could lead to a lost decade. Uh, by China and left well behind by the USA. In retrospect, this isn't surprising. The country had a lot of underlying issues and really not that many global- No, that's why cyberpunk stuff is all Japanese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why it has Japanese or it looks like all the future um, corporations are Japanese. It's because it comes from that era when everybody thought Japan conglomerates would take over. Uh... ...advantages. Simon Kuznets once said that there are four types of economies in the world. Undeveloped economies, advanced economies, Argentina, and Japan. <laughs> Argentina is an economy that has had every chance to be successful, but still isn't. And Japan is an economy that has had every reason to fail, but still hasn't. Based. What's even more shocking is that after more than three decades of economic stagnation, Japan might be looking to make a bit of a recovery as a range of economic factors play out in its favour. This is a very exciting possibility that has the keen attention of a lot of economists because in many ways Japan is an economy ahead of its time, meaning that the stagnation experienced mm. in Japan in the 1990s might not be a problem unique to the country, but might instead be something that all economies can expect once they've- Their stock market is coming back, but I think there's more to the economy than that because I, I have friends in Japan, we were talking to them, Ari's maid of honor, and they're like, the yen is so fucking bad, they feel poor. <laughs> like all of the money they were getting paid before like just feels it goes way less far uh become sufficiently advanced it's just that japan was the first country in the world to reach that level it's nice to think that the historic trend of limitless growth in a finite world will continue forever in our own economies but it's good if you but travel japan there shows a number of concerning warnings why the great, yeah, great time for a japan vacation countries may be an exception rather than the expectation and those factors are worth exploring in some detail it's also worth exploring how Japan and potentially our own economies might manage this stagnation to develop this economies guy? that aren't reliant on economic growth. <laughs> Is this Despite stock footage? Problems, Japan still gets praise for its living standards and handling of issues like housing affordability. Yeah. So, what is indicating that Japan could finally be in for an economic recovery? Okay. Does this mean that limitless growth could be possible in our own economies? And finally, what would happen to the country if it stagnated forever? After they passed a vague and heavy-handed state secrecy law in 2013, Japan's media outlets have not really been able to criticise the government for fear of being censored. <laughs> it's very hard to talk about Japanese economics without an honest look at the information coming out of the island nation. That's why I'm glad that. to be sponsored by Ground News. No, website... dude. No. Censure have merely reported the fact that this ban has been lifted, but international media outlets like Reuters have drawn attention to the fact that TEPCO have had safety breaches oh, that have not it? yet been fully addressed. Incredibly useful. So go to ground.news oh, slash explain <laughs> or the link in the description and get 30% off an annual subscription on the Vantage we, plan, no, which is we, what I use. We didn't watch uh, the new Donkey video. Japan is a country that is stuck living in the year 2000, but they've been living there since the 1970s. That's the what dream. That is that during their boom, every Zoomer wants to be living back in the year 2000. They're just going to move to Japan. That's why they're all weebs, bro. They were decades ahead of their time. Japan was technologically well ahead of all of their advanced rivals, and they were producing cutting-edge gadgets and building world-class infrastructure. I do think it's crazy. Sorry, I'm not interrupting. But I do think it's crazy that, like, obviously Sony is still known because of the PlayStation, and it's good. But if you go back, like, even the tail end of it when I was a kid, Sony was, like, the sickest. It was, like, Apple you know, on steroids. Sony, everyone thought of Sony as like the ultimate fucking brand. <laughs> I don't know if there's any millennials in chat can remember. Do you guys remember like in the, in the nineties, late nineties, maybe even early two thousands, it was like, people thought Sony was ultimate luxury. And now they don't have any of that. Like nobody feels like Sony's really cutting edge on anything. They're not, uh, but it was, de they definitely like had this moment where 
it might have been like a top five brand in the world. Actually, I remember specifically, there's a Steve Jobs interview where he's talking about the really, truly great brands in the world. He's like McDonald's, uh, Nike, um, Sony. <laughs> and if you listen to it now, it hits your ear a little wrong. It's like his three great brands, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just weird that it's changed. They adopted computers faster than the West, and they were using all of this to be some of the most. Yeah, productive Samsung people is definitely like. Unfortunately, Japan is still living in the year two thousand. their spot a bit. Only now that means that they are twenty three years behind. This is clearly visible in a lot of their most important industries. Japan used to be the defining example of high tech, but now it's struggling with adopting new technologies. Its companies are falling well behind rivals in the USA. Yeah. Just Microsoft and Apple are together worth more than every single public company <laughs> in Japan combined. That's inclusive of all of their other companies, not just their once dominant That's tech companies, up. which apart from Sony just That's really don't have up. nearly the global influence they once did. Mobile phones are one of the largest and most value adding markets in the world. Japan used to produce a massive share of the world's mobile phones and having a phone from Japan was considered a big deal because they were normally more advanced and more valuable than regular mobile yeah. phones. Now this lucrative market is dominated by companies from the US, South Korea and China. The decline of technological dominance has hurt the economy in more ways than just missing out on selling mobile phones as well. Also, the last real, I mean, they still have Nintendo as based, but like the last real big export uh, in Japan is like automobiles. And Toyota is obviously the biggest in the world in terms of shipment of actual cars. But, um, you know, the rise of China as an automobile ex exporter is like really cutting in Japan. Like Japan's got to be worried. Well, uh, within an economy, technology can anime. also be used to make existing workers more productive. A single worker digging with an excavator will be able to do the same work as a hundred laborers digging with shovels. And the utilization of technology carries this idea forward to almost any industry in an economy. The more that an individual worker can make in a given amount of time, the more productive they are. And since economies are usually measured using gross domestic product, the collective productivity of all workers in that economy is very important because there are really only three ways to improve GDP or total economic outputs. The first is by getting workers to work for longer. Boo! If one million workers in an economy can produce $30 worth of output an hour and they work a thousand hours per year, then that economy will have a GDP of $30 billion. If that economy instead got all of its workers to work for 2,000 hours a year, then it will have doubled its GDP to $60 billion. Another way to do the same thing is to get more people in an economy have to babies. work. This is measured using the workforce or labour force participation rate, which takes the total number of people over 16 who are working or are looking for work, and then divides it by the total number of people of working age, minus those that are imprisoned or otherwise institutional. <laughs> Can I say something? This is going to be in wins and fails, so uh, act surprised if I do it again. But... Uh... This is how you, uh, like, the way they calculate unemployment is, like, number of people looking for a job divided by number of people that actually get one. And in China, they stopped reporting youth unemployment because it was too high. <laughs> you know, it was too high. It was, it was a bad look, so they just stopped reporting it. They recently, like a week ago, they brought it back, and the number was way lower. And everyone's like, what? <laughs> how did you suddenly solve youth unemployment? Like, how did you, <laughs> how did you fix it? And it turns out, what they did was, if you are looking for a job, but you're a student, or actually, if you haven't got your degree yet, then you don't count, even if you're looking. <laughs> so every single young person, 16 to 24, who is a student or hasn't got their degree and is looking for a job, they don't count. They took them out of the system. So the only employment counts is if you're already graduated and haven't found a job. Which is, you know, a pretty deceiving way to calculate youth unemployment, but that's what they did. Uh, and now it's way lower. Which in some countries can make a big difference to these calculations. Labor force participation rate in a country like the USA and Japan is only around 63%. Hybrids greater than every EV. People will always come back to Japan when they realize that no matter what. Uh, I don't know if that's hundo p true but i do think like if you want a good reliable car you go toyota baby or honda i'm a honda hog all day every day of the week um but i do think there's going to be a continued rise in pure ev vehicles i just think that's i think that's where we're headed but um it'll be a time for sure uh helpful honda people are goaded i'm not helpful <laughs> don't ever ask me for help i'm a hateful honda person 
If I drive by you on the side of the road and you need help, I will try to splash water in your face in my Honda. And I say, should have bought a Honda if their cars broke down. I do that actually for fun. I do that, I do that literally. Sometimes when I'm not live, it's because I'm out driving to try and find people who've broken down. Um, just like a fun little hobby. It's not like a big deal. It's not like a bad thing to do. It's just a fun. Which means almost 40% of people of working age don't work. This can be because they don't need to, they can't because of a disability, or because they're supported by a partner or other family. If a theoretical economy with 1 million workers doubled its labour force participation rate to 2 million workers, all other things been equal, it would also double its economic output. These are Japanese One of the citizens? most efficient ways to do this over the last five decades has been to encourage women into the workforce, as historically they've made up a large share of non-participating labour in paid positions. Now, getting more people to work for longer only, well, works up until a point. Eventually there may not be enough jobs to go around which can still produce as much value per hour as the economy expects. If Japan doubled its labour force and then doubled how many hours everyone was working that in sounds year, miserable. it should theoretically quadruple its economic <laughs> output. But what is more likely to happen is that overworked people fighting for fewer jobs end up producing something like $10 worth of value an hour, so only a very marginal improvement in total output is achieved, with a policy that will probably have huge social costs. Today, Japan's labour force participation rate is down from its all-time high, but only by around 5%, and that's from a time when work in the country was a lot more basic, so it was easier to just get a job without a specialised education. The USA, by comparison, okay. has seen a much sharper decline in participation rate over just the last decade. Japan is also already notorious for overworking its people, as the country <laughs> has a culture of putting in long hours, even if they're not particularly productive. You gotta it's good grind. for impressing the bosses, but not particularly good for impressing the macroeconomists, because it's going to be impossible to get the Japanese economy to achieve growth by asking people to work more if they're already working more than almost every other country in the world. Doesn't productivity have a steep payoff, a steep drop off after four hours in a day? I think so. I don't know the exact stats, but in my mind, um. You really only have like four or five hours, probably four hours of good, <laughs> of good work. And then everything after that becomes slop. <laughs> you know, I think, I think you can do eight hours, but it's not eight hours of fucking, I think you get burned. Uh, if you're, if you're focusing, like focused, sometimes you can do something that's non-focused for eight hours, but uh, you can read an email. Yeah. But you can't like. I don't know, work, think, and produce something that you want to. Um, uh, depends on the job. Three hours of good work, then you make that shit. You need to come to read it the next day. Yeah, I'm. I don't know. I, I again, I, I, I understand some people work twelve hour shifts on certain things, but. I just cannot imagine they are mentally not destroyed <laughs> by the end of that shift. And I think they would agree. I, I, don't, I don't think it's really like you're the, the, there's, I think there's a drastic difference in quality. I think if you are somebody who's uh, like, for example, I have a friend who's an EMT and he tells me uh, about some of these 12 hour days, four 12 hour days, he does it a week. And like, you know, even by the end of that week, the quality is dropping. <laughs> you, if you're going to get uh, it seriously injured, try to do it in the morning when the EMTs are fresh, okay? Try to do it <laughs> at the beginning of a shift change because by the end of it, they're just not... Just, like, plan around that, okay? Mm. Another option for achieving economic growth is just to have more people overall. More people means more workers, and it still means proportionally the same amount of labour participation can be maintained if people want to stay at home to raise a family or for whatever other reason. The options for growing a population are having more children or bringing in people from abroad. Again, unfortunately, Japan sucks at both of these. Partially because of how overworked everyone is, Japan has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. Yeah. This problem is also past a tipping point now where a large enough share of the population is too old to have children and they're putting more pressure on the yeah. younger generations to either... So this is why I think, I mean, this is, a, I guess, supposed to be a positive video about Japan, but in my mind, this is just reminding me of all the things that are <laughs> really tough there. Uh, yeah, they're having a stock market uptick lately, largely because they have, like, negative interest rates. But I... I don't think things are too great. And I think demographically, this is a real fucking problem. Uh, there's just so many old people and not enough young people and no one's having kids. Directly or uh, indirectly take care of them as they're too old to work or look after themselves 
which leaves less time and resources to raise a young family. Now, a low birth rate is not unique to Japan. Most advanced economies in the world today are not having enough children to maintain their population, but they're instead relying on migration from countries with higher birth rates, which typically tend to be poorer to keep their population level steady or even drive yeah, Japan doesn't population do it. growth. This can cause a lot of problems for the poorer economies with higher birth rates that those migrants are coming from, because it's usually the best and brightest from those countries that are offered opportunities to live and work in advanced economies, which means that the countries that are least able to afford it are losing their best workers right after they've already invested resources into raising and educating them. Now we've already made an entire video on the potentially crippling effects of brain drain, so I don't want to repeat too much here. But for advanced economies, all of the harmful side effects are reversed and for the most part they only get the upside. Advanced economies get highly productive tax paying workers right as they enter the workforce and they didn't even need to invest anything into raising them as children or educating that? them to become such a valuable worker in the first place. Achieving economic growth by just bringing in more workers can often lead to a result that's better than the sum of its parts as well. All other things being equal, just adding equally efficient workers won't do much because sure, production is increasing but it's spread out over more people. An extreme example of this is that China has a much larger economy than Norway, but realistically most people would prefer to live in Norway because the quality of life there is much better, because each individual person is much more productive. Now that is true, but migration can still increase economic- I'm getting pissed with Norway. <laughs> I'm getting pissed about Norway, dude. I think it was this guy's last video. We're talking up Norway too much. We got any Norwegian chatters? Serious question. I'm not even joking. No, actually, I'm done. Joke over. Do we have any Norwegian chatters? Uh, here? Okay. Uh, at I'm underscore Arten. I am joking, and I want everybody to make fun of you. <laughs> I was baiting you into admitting it. I am underscore A-R-T-N. Everyone, please make fun of you. Take them down a peg. What the fuck, dude? Norwegian ass. It's cringe, dude. You guys all just fucking talk about how happy you are. We get it, dude. It's fucking, you eat salmon and it's fucking cold. <laughs> like, it's not, by a large it's not based to be so happy. Population <laughs> because most migrant workers will be, well, workers, as opposed to roughly 40% of the population that isn't involved in paid work in places like the USA and Japan, and they also tend to be more productive than the average overall. Skilled migrant workers in the USA, for example, earn significantly more than the national average because the USA has the luxury of only picking the very, very best workers that apply to live and work there, because a lot of people from around the world want to live there because the opportunities to live a great life are far more abundant than they would be in their home countries. So, increasing the total population of skilled workers we have the most is McDonald's. also an effective way to increase total economic output. If Japan was able to attract skilled migration at the same rate and of the same quality of the USA, it would very likely solve their economic stagnation within a decade. But Japan has been incredibly resistant to this strategy, and the real question is, why? Well, Japanese is not a widely spoken second language, which makes it difficult for most people looking for a better opportunity to live and work to pick it over an English speaking country, which is far more widely spoken. The country is also just not as attractive in terms of opportunity. Their reputation for overwork is widely known, and that's not exactly the way of life that highly productive people are going to move countries to pursue. Thanks to ongoing stagnation, average salaries in Japan are also now significantly lower than in places like the USA, Canada, Yeah, Australia, the salaries and are bad. Europe. They were once comparable, or even higher, but that was three decades ago. Quality of life is also generally not as high, and it's important to address a potential- Okay, I mean- the one thing they have is they have amazing public transit. They have a very clean cities. Everything is clean. They got healthy food. They walk a lot. I mean, they're healthier. <laughs> they have good health care. Like, you know, there's a lot we can learn from Japan. I'm not... Uh, quality of life is a pretty nebulous comment, but they do have... They have bidets. They got... Yeah, they have well-designed homes. They do have high rates of sexual harassment. Uh, yeah, tougher, tougher society to be a woman. Um, yeah, Ari had a really rosy, uh, ideal of Japan. And then she studied abroad or did an internship there. And she was like, yeah, it's not, I mean, they're, <laughs> they definitely don't treat women super well. I think it's fucking, uh, but she wasn't like, she wasn't harassed or I'm not saying it, but it was just like, she could see, she could tell it was like, it was, you know, it's not the same treatment. Um, uh, 
actually controversial side note. What did Ardu for work in Japan? She did industrial design, like designing packaging and, um, you know, like 3D models of products. Uh, it's cool. She did that. It was sick. Yeah. Japanese housing. Japan and Tokyo in particular is often praised for its affordable. You guys might know if any of you are yard viewers, she did the packaging and uh, thing for the Amaranth Pocket Pussy. <laughs> If you want to know, uh, they like needed someone and they got her last minute. I was like, Ari, can you do this? We need someone to design the package. And she made the whole fucking design in the box and everything. Uh, they paid well. They paid well. So Ari crushed it. Uh, that's a legacy. That's the thing you just might know that she did. But she doesn't do that. I mean, she doesn't do industrial design. She does cosplay stuff now, but uh, she's still got those skills. She did. You know how I did that stream recently? Maybe you didn't. But I did a stream recently where I tried to learn Blender and make a Glock. I spent like 20 minutes learning how to do Blender and make a Glock. She's actually watched Blender YouTube tutorials every single night for, I don't know, three weeks a month and is now really good at Blender. And now she 3D prints things that she makes herself and she's like, it's cool. She's uh, I, I'm she's crazy. I, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a wife guy. <laughs> Let me tell you. Well, housing <laughs> an incredible feat considering that despite uh, all the challenges we've already explored in this video it's still the largest and most productive metropolitan area in the world despite that though me and chance Tokyo the rapper get along let me just say that i've been listening to a lot of chance the rapper lately including those that are in countries that are poorer overall the way that they've achieved this is a great case study into the factors that determine the price in an economic market one thing the country has got right over cities that are notorious for unaffordable housing is that development is a lot less restricted Housing can be built right alongside offices and factories, and there are few limits on how tall a building can be, so where a freestanding home might exist in a city like Sydney, a dense apartment building would most likely take its place in Tokyo. Okay. That has meant that there's an abundance of very cheap housing all over the massive city yeah. and all throughout the country. Hell yeah! The cost of comparable goods is one of the main things that determines the price of any good. If a Toyota Corolla costs $100,000, but a Honda Civic costs $20,000, then Toyota wouldn't sell too many Corollas because most rational consumers would pick a comparable car that costs twenty thousand. I would pay a hundred grand for the Honda with one wheel missing. As a lifelong Honda hog, I would never ever betray my kings. Okay. Dollars. The same thing would happen if a C-Class Mercedes costs fifty thousand dollars, but a Civic still costs twenty thousand. I would trade a C-Class Mercedes for a, a car Honda. Get them from point A to point B reliably. <laughs> So Mercedes would really have to provide some alternative value to justify their car being worth more than two times another car that could achieve the same end results. That makes sense for cars, but most major cities around the world fail to provide the equivalent of that Honda Civic, which is cheap basic housing that will reliably provide convenient accommodation to workers, even those on a tight budget. Strict so Rise up RAV4 gang. I probably would have got a RAV4 um, right after college because they were, it's a pretty good car and it's uh, a good price. And then I heard that Kanye lyric where he says, what you think I rap for to push a fucking RAV4? And then I knew I could never buy it. <laughs> it was a different era of Kanye and I really I really respected the man and I did not want that. I, I, I'm not I'm only like half joking. I really, like, once I heard that lyric, a RAV4 was off the table. <laughs> But now, I guess, RAV4 holders, you hodled. You hodled through the Kanye depression, and now you're actually looking like the right people on the other side. You're actually coming out on the other side smarter because he really, that was, that was diamond hands of you. Uh... Zoning laws and the huge value of land close to city centers means that it's just not worth it to build cheap housing because expensive luxury apartments or freestanding homes would sell just as I. I know that I'm getting off topic, but I would love to have diagrams like this for Marketing Mondays. By the way, shout out to Eric Sinch, who did a fucking killer job um, editing the last video. He added a bunch of cool things like this, but like, this is what I want. I think this adds a lot to what is being said. As well, and uh, make more money. And in turn, the reason that they will sell so well is because people don't have any other option. Tokyo, with its loose regulations around zoning and development, has an abundance of cheap housing, which in turn pulls down the price of more premium options as well, because it gives buyers a cheaper comparable good. Another factor that determines price, which is particularly important to a lot of unaffordable homes around the world today, 
is the expectation of future value. Yeah. Tokyo, and by extension the rest of Japan, was not always making headlines for its comparatively affordable housing. Quite the opposite, it once had some of the most expensive real estate on the planet. At the height of the Japanese real estate bubble, a 10,000 yen note, worth around 200 US dollars today, would be worth less than the ground it would cover if it was laid on the streets <laughs> of central Tokyo. The imperial palace at the heart of the city was said to be worth more than all of the real estate in California yeah. combined. I was just going to say that. That's a very common uh, anecdote. I've heard that many, many times in places. The imperial palace is worth more than all of the real estate in California, which is, <laughs> you know... It was absurd. They had, they had one of the craziest real estate bubbles ever. There Again, there was like four Japanese real estate companies in the top 10 companies worldwide. Instead of like Apple, Microsoft, Google, whatever, it was like Japan Real Estate Trust, Japan Real Estate Bank. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it was crazy. It was, a, it was a, 1989. It's like a really weird time if you look at it. Uh, Which even back then was not a state famous for its affordability. The primary driver of these prices was the expectation that the prices would be even higher in the future. This pressured people to buy either because they were afraid they would miss out on their opportunity to ever be able to afford a home, or because they wanted to profit from future price increases. Eventually the Asian financial crisis hit the country and burst this bubble as people quickly realised that Tokyo wasn't ever going to be home to 100 million people like was expected back then, and a surge of housing development was flooding the market with affordable homes. Japan also has incredibly high inheritance taxes, with as much as 55% of someone's estate being taxed by the government for all of the passed down value over the equivalent of around half a million US dollars. Big expensive family. Um, what's funny is a lot of this, you guys seem to be asking what happened. Uh, it's a pretty complex topic. I'm not sure I could give you an expert level opinion on it, but <laughs> there was this thing called the Plaza Accord, which is like uh, around, yeah, it's in the late 80s, 1980s, okay? And uh, <laughs> Japan was doing too well, basically. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the, the Spark Notes version of it. Japan was doing too well, and so America little broed them and had a meeting, had this Plaza Accord where they're like, hey, we need to agree. <laughs> to uh, raise the value of the yen, which again makes their exports less competitive. And we need to like rebalance the trade here so that you're getting more American goods and we're getting. And uh, Japan agreed. <laughs> Japan agreed and then almost immediately they have the Asian financial crisis. So it's like, a <laughs> and then ever since then, Japan did not really recover. So it is, I mean, it's not, it's not one to one. Again, I'm not saying the Plaza Accords 100% really caused this, but it was like Japan was riding real fucking high and uh, post Plaza Accord, they immediately had trouble because they the, the yen got rebalanced in value. They were kind of artificially making it low so their exports were better. If your currency is cheap, your, your, your exports are more competitive. And so it's just a funny little quirk of history that like this meeting happened. And, and the reason I read about it was in context of China, which is like, they have studied the Plaza Accords and they will never let that happen to them. <laughs> like China, if one thing is very well aware of how this meeting went down and, and like what was said and what, and they're like, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not about it. Uh family homes or luxury apartments. Anyway, so therefore that is a simplification. There's a, there's a lot more to it. I mean, I actually, I, I was reading a really long thing about it, but I, I, that just like a funny little anecdote of mystery. Now seen as uh, a bit of a burden or at the very least something that is ultimately a disposable, like a fancy car. The final factor that is worth mentioning that determines the price of a good like housing is the cost of complementary goods. Petrol is a complementary good to petrol? a regular internal combustion car. If petrol cost $100 a litre, there wouldn't be that much demand for cars. To stretch this, one of the most important complementary goods to housing is access to... If gas costs $100 a gallon, we don't say liter here and we don't say petrol, okay? But if gas costs 100 American dollars a gallon, I would drive down the street, windows down in a Hummer, so everybody know that I'm cool and rich. <laughs> okay? I would drive up and down the street, okay? Probably in front of teachers and firemen, and I would have the fucking Hummer full gas guzzling, okay? Because that's what it's about. That's what society is built for. I need people to know America built. You could do that now. No, I can't afford it. I can't afford gas as it currently is. <laughs> 
This is a fiction. This is a dream I have at night. I just dream of flexing on public service workers. Uh, to high paying jobs. If workers in a particular region earn significantly more than anywhere else in the world. How much is gas in LA right now? $102, if you'll believe it. <laughs> I'm actually asking for a price cut. If Yeah, I'm actually. It's actually pricey down here, bro. Uh. I have an oil slick button like a cartoon character and force teachers and other hardworking individuals off the road. <laughs> based. So base, dude. I love that. I love that. You're clearly aiming for the right thing. As I always try to teach around here. The goal of life should be accumulating money for the purposes of making other people feel worse. That is what it's about. That's like I, that's the exact moral philosophy you should have. The naturally demand uh, for housing in that region like a dragon hoarding higher, gold. Yeah. And people with their higher incomes will be able to afford houses that are worth more. <laughs> Today, a big reason why Japanese housing is cheap is because wages have been mostly stagnant for three decades. This was a very long side note already, but it also must be recognised as it relates to attracting skilled migrants into Japan to try and boost its economic output. Affordable housing might look like a great bonus on the surface, but another reason why this housing is so budget friendly is because it's tiny and totally lacking the luxuries that most people enjoy in even developing economies around the world. To a skilled migrant looking for a new place to call home, they could get established in a city where they could earn more, live in a nice big house and build wealth for themselves and future generations, or they could live in Japan where they'll be expected to work 80 hours a week, live in a tiny home built wherever there was room, and know that most of what they work for won't make it to their children. There are very strong economic and even moral arguments that what Japan is doing is the right thing here, but for people looking out for their own self-interests it's just not a particularly enticing place. Not that it matters anyway, because Japan has historically made school migration very difficult, and even workers who are able to make it in will find it difficult to integrate into a very insular culture that is not overly fond of outsiders. So if Japan can't improve its economic output through working its people harder... Is Japan just San Francisco as a country? Japan is way nicer to live in than San Francisco. <laughs> way nicer. And, and way less expensive. Uh, yeah, way, 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 way cleaner. Uh, uh, you mean like housing? No, because did you hear, it's the opposite. Housing is cheap in, in Japan. It's just like... <laughs> This is not necessarily, like, what he's trying to say is, like, this may not be a good thing, but people buy houses in other countries expecting the value will go up so they have something to retire on. If you buy a house in America or, or Canada or whatever, the idea is that in 20 years it's worth a lot more and you can sell it and retire and downsize. But, like, um, in Japan, there's less likely that's going to happen. There's not much price appreciation. doesn't get bigger. So... It's more of a good that's used to live in, which is, I think, a better way <laughs> to structure a society, but it's it deters people from living there. Um, or bringing in more workers, the last option is to increase how much its workers can make in a given hour of work. Increasing worker productivity is really the best way to increase economic output, because the other two strategies obviously have eventual limits. People can only work so many hours, and an economy can only accommodate so many people before things get worse rather than better. Now, as we explored earlier, the best way to increase worker productivity is by giving them access to better tools and technology, and that's really where Japan has failed. So the next question is, how did they lose their technological lead? Japanese companies have been identified by economists as being incredibly conservative with any kind of new processes. What? That doesn't make sense, because I know a Japanese company called Nintendo, and they were the first to get online this new wave of online gaming. They jumped in both feet head first, and they made sure their consumers could get awesome new online games uh, as early as 2029, 20, okay? That's incredible. <laughs> That's incredible, dude. They've been thinking with the future. Uh, fax me your friend code. <laughs> they knew that the way people wanted to play video games online is by finding a long friend code that they would share with their friends <laughs> and being able to play uh, laggy, adapter-based online games with two people. And I thought that was genius. That was foresight. There's nothing conservative about that. 
The only reason they developed so quickly after the Second World War was because that represented such a big shake-up that they were effectively starting from scratch and resistance from established norms hadn't had time to work its way into new industries yet. Now industries across the country are right back to it and leadership, which is mostly quite old, still thinks the best way to do stuff is exactly how they've been doing it since their peak in the late <laughs> 1980s. Yeah, Again, good. Japan is a country that's been living in the year 2000 since the 1970s. Ahead of their time then, but way behind it now. It's a clever way Japan to put it. has also had very low inflation, which means that companies have found it incredibly difficult to raise the prices of domestic products, which in turn makes it harder for them to create goods that are going to compete globally. The government of Japan has tried to fight this by basically doing what other governments around the world have been doing during COVID, only they've been doing it since the early 2000s. But even despite massive increases in the money supply, Japanese households just chose to save the money rather than consume or invest. That is looking to finally be starting to change, as countries around the world had to correct for the inflation their COVID stimulus measures caused. Uh, they're saying this like a good thing. Again, I, I'm gonna just give my take, and I'm not saying I, I have the correct one. I'm not saying anyone knows the 100% answer on this. But what it looks like is that Japan, if you guys don't know, Japan has the largest government debt in the world. They've printed more money compared to their GDP than any other company, by far. It's like 250% of their GDP. They, they their, their government has uh, basically free borrowing, 0% or negative percent interest rates, and their government prints like crazy, okay? Insane debt, absurd levels of debt. Um, it, to the point where <laughs> no one, you know, like if, if, if the government wants to borrow money to buy a tank or whatever, they'll issue an IOU. That's what the US government does, a treasury bond, an IOU. The Japanese government issues these IOUs and then prints money and buys them from themselves. <laughs> They basically just punt the problem till later. <laughs> That's what they do, okay? J Japan buys almost all of their own treasury bonds. We America does it a little bit sometimes. I mean, a lot of countries do this, but Japan buys like uh, like 80% of the treasury bonds are bought by themselves. They completely own the market. So, so, but they have all they have some incredible miracle. They have a lot of things that prevent them from getting inflation. Um, I am not an expert on this. All I know is that the, dude, there's a lot of dogs barking. Let me actually one second. Can you check? Uh, what's wrong with dogs? Oh, I'll just check on the dogs. All right, they're good. Anyway, I'm back. So the, the point is that uh, Japan, they've been printing all this fucking money and they haven't got inflation, which you should normally get if you have as much debt as Japanese government does and print as much money as they do. But they just have a lot of different things naturally creating deflation, which counterbalances it. Finally, they're starting to get some inflation. And they're saying it like it's a good thing. And everyone's like, okay, well, now you can finally stop printing money, right? Now that you've finally got a stable amount of 2 to 3% inflation, you're going to stop printing money. And they haven't stopped at all. <laughs> and like a lot of people that I read are like, they could have pr printed this a while ago. They're like, hey, look. Japan keeps saying they're only printing money to get inflation back up to a normal level, and then they'll stop. <laughs> and then, but we think that's not going to happen. We think they're addicted to it, and they're not. <laughs> there's no way it's going to stop. And they haven't stopped. They're still doing it like crazy. And so there's a real chance they just keep devaluing the yen, and it makes it weaker and weaker. And uh, the inflation starts rocketing past two to three percent, and gets to become a real problem. And if you had a weak currency and high inflation, then your country's kind of fucked. And so that's based on what I'm reading is like a real risk of what's happening in Japan. So I don't see it as a good thing. Like they're, they're, they're in the sweet spot right now where it's two to 3% and it seems like, oh, we fixed it, everything's okay. But it feels like it's heading up to be worse. That's what I'm, that's my worry and fear that I would need more time before you say everything's all clear. Uh, I mean, their, their debt is like unpayable. If you really look into it, J Japan's level of government debt is absurd. It's, it's- Was uh, Japan welcomed it because it's exactly what they've been after for years. Their Tiger companies Beer, had up, to, man? in the past, make public apologies for raising the price of their product by a few yen, the equivalent of a few cents. Now they have the opportunity to raise prices to levels that made more sense, so they could make a profit by making better products, rather than by cutting expenses and working their employees as hard as possible. The pandemic was just another shake-up. Obviously not one nearly on the scale of the Second World War, but it did shift the status quo enough for some significant changes to take place in a country that has otherwise been very resistant to change. Beyond all of that, even if it didn't create these circumstances directly, the Japanese economy will be the beneficiary of new technologies and shifts in global geopolitics. The elephant in the room is that China is now doing yeah. a lot of the manufacturing that Japan used to do. 
But with the rise of friendshoring and onshoring and the relative slide of Japanese wages and currency value, it's once again looking like a very competitive alternative, especially when considering the reputation that Japan now has for producing goods of high quality. The Nobel laureate economist Paul Krugman, potentially the most influential economist alive today, said I, that in the short term, I don't like him. I'm not going to say anything. But in the long term, it's almost everything. Mm -hmm. That was just a really cryptic way of saying that economists often spend too much time looking at output figures, either on a national or individual level, over the course of months or years, and those kinds of metrics won't have much of an impact on people's actual everyday lives. But over decades, a country needs to be aware of how productive its people are, because it determines everything from the quality of life they enjoy to their global competitiveness. Sure. Japan has maintained strong living conditions despite its stagnation, and it's even doing certain things in its economy arguably even better than the West. But. If its productivity stalls endlessly, the world is going to grow up around it, and not only will it struggle to remain competitive, its own people could start to look for better opportunities abroad. Nobody can predict the future, least of all economists, but hopefully the projections are right and the economy of Japan can start maintaining long-term growth again for the good of its people and the global economy as a whole. In this video we talked about the stagnation of Japan's Okay, why do people hate this guy so much? I, I thought the video was fine. Is it because he's Australian? I get it. <laughs> his voice, his accent, you know, it's not English. It's not... But the video is fine. I don't think he said anything out of pocket. Uh, I don't think he said anything out of pocket, bro. Uh, I think it was like everything in there was credible and sourced uh, in this video. I haven't seen all his videos. That was fine, though. Um, now, again, I'm not, a, you know, in general, I'm not a huge fan of the knockoffs of this. I think he's one of the earliest to do this. But all of the uh, stock footage business youtube channels <laughs> it's like they or they like you know they just read a wikipedia article or something on a business event and they put stock footage over it and then uh, they take all the great stories and headlines uh the thumbnails um sometimes his videos are not very good like very bad it feels like you added some context to make it feel more affordable yeah maybe i did uh it was interesting to me i i read a lot about japan um but that that video didn't seem like he said anything out of pocket. Um, good video about clickbait. Can I tell you something? Oh, the very tacit video? We watched this. I think I reacted to this and made a video about it, <laughs> to be honest. Back in my React on main channel era. Uh, Guy kayaks to the most. Well, we're going to watch House actually pretty soon. Cool video on AOE2 esports. How awesome is it that we have. Uh, I watched some of this. It was dope. Age of Empires 2 is the esport that won't die, bro. It's crazy. It's crazy how long it's been running. And they still have some of the fucking greatest competitors. Uh, AOE2 AOE is sick. Yeah, Viper and Doubt, and they did a yeah they did a tournament recently with a big prize pool and um uh, bring back AOE four. I retired on top, you know what I'm saying? They called me the all time greatest AOE four player in history. I was the goat, and I just didn't need to do it. Um, the twenty eight billion dollar anime sweatshop industry. Ay yeah yeah. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, in a bad way. <laughs> uh, a little too long. It won't be, it'll go over into house time. Seems interesting though. Great video on business school. Oh, I, I, I like this guy. This good work guy. Uh, let's watch it. I, I actually got this recommended to me, and I didn't watch it because I thought about watching it on stream. This good work guy. He's got, he's got a charm to him. Uh, and much better hair than me, to be honest. It's not fair. Uh, let's see. Good work. I have no doubt that you're capable of making me look like an idiot, regardless of what I say today. Where's this gonna be? Uh, YouTube. Do you think professors look at YouTube videos? No. Do you ever meet students who are unethical? Sure. What is this called? It's called I Went to Business School. Okay. Get a partner now. There's no one here. The dating is horrible. Don't do it. The dating... 
The, da the dating's bad. <laughs> and MBA can be very helpful for that. It's not a degree for everybody. There are too many MBAs being produced. Today I woke up at 8 a.m., went to the gym until 9 a.m., took a shower. This is actually really relevant because some of you are in business school, and when you graduate, you're going to go into a job market that is either good or bad. I'm not going to predict. Well, I'm going to predict my predictions, but let's say we don't know. If the job market is bad, a choice people often make is to go to grad school. That's they say, okay, the job market's bad. I'm gonna just I'm gonna dip and I'm gonna go to grad school. Uh let's see, where's here, for example, is a chart I was looking at today uh of the spike and number of students enrolling in graduate school in the recession of 08. <laughs> so you can see low enrollment and then a recession, and then it goes high. The people it spikes. People just go to business school because they want to dodge the market. Not even a necessarily a terrible idea, but the problem is business schools are so uh, expensive. A mistake people make? Yeah, it's a mistake people make. I mean, I think I think if you're going to a really expensive business school, uh, it, you know, it's tough to make the money back because it's. But if you can't find a job in your field and you think four years will get you there, I don't know. I'm not gonna. I don't want to speak. Everyone's situation is different. Um, but. This, this could happen in your life. I mean, I think realistically, a lot of people are going to be thinking about grad school uh, in the near future. And so it's it's interesting to read about this. Like quick, but also sad lovemaking because I was crying. And I think it's a lot better for Europeans because uh, grad school and, that, and the like are just way cheaper. I think the problem is American grad school is just so fucking ridiculously expensive. And it's like during time you theoretically could have a job. So you don't have the job. So you're losing the money you would make at the job and you're spending money. So it's just like, it's like tough. It's like you really got to fucking nail it out of the grad school uh, to make up for it. Like every week. By the way, it's... your apartment, your apartment looks like a hotel where someone goes to kill themselves. Right? <laughs> you're probably wondering why Fred Nimode over here just made fun of what I thought was an immaculately decorated apartment. But to explain that, one has to traverse the long road back to the start of today's investigation. So I took this guy's class. This is Scott Galloway. Uh, he's the one that wrote the book Algebra of Happiness that I recommend. And I took his class uh, online while I was at NVIDIA. That's was pretty good. You're just made uh, fun of what I thought was an immaculately decorated apartment. But to explain that, one has to traverse the long road back to the start of today's investigation, oh, which yeah. took us deep into the mysterious breeding ground where the next generation of business leaders are harvested. A dark rabbit hole where corporate larvae retreat to undergo metamorphosis. I'm talking, of course, about business school. <laughs> The Master's in Business Administration, or MBA, <laughs> has been the most popular graduate degree in America since 2010. Roughly 250,000 people are enrolled in MBA oh, programs worldwide, with That's over 150,000 here in the U.S. However, only a tiny fraction of those students are enrolled in so-called top-tier MBA programs, stemming from universities like Harvard, Northwestern, Duke, and other stickers on the back of the Jeep Grand Cherokee that just cut you off. And yet, <laughs> despite these programs' prestige, some critics wonder if the degree is too expensive, too exclusive, or just plain overrated. So what's up? with business school. I spoke to students, experts, and exactly two bald men to investigate <laughs> as thoroughly as I could. Our investigation began at the Darden School of Business in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I spoke with students to try to better understand life inside an MBA program. MBAs, what do we think of them? Um, interesting bunch. How'd you end up here? I was having a good time at my old job, but decided that I wanted to do something different. And business school seemed like the best and most expensive way to do it. <laughs> Why get an MBA? I think it helps you understand all of the facets of running a business, see multiple people's perspectives, like accounting or legal or marketing. And why is it necessary to know marketing's perspective? They're stupid. Has it ever happened where you <laughs> hadn't done the reading and you were called on? No. Do you read the... I actually don't... I don't think this video is very good. Let's watch the donkey video. Can we watch the donkey video again? I feel like this video... Something about it just doesn't... I don't think the vibes are off. Am I right? I feel like the vibes are so off. It doesn't... It's not... <laughs> I feel like we should watch more Donkey, dude. Let's get that Dunkster going.
The cases uh, every time? I do not. The average Darden student, I think there are two kinds. Do you know, like, people who went to prep school and who feel like they've always been the cool kids, but are really not the cool kids, you have that as, like, the average student. And then the other end is people are actually cool kids, but don't think they're cool kids. <laughs> Maybe if there was a prep kid standing right next to you, you would say, no, I actually think he's very cool. <laughs> I would be frank to say no. <laughs> What's more useful to know for a life in business, ethics or golfing? Uh, that's like a really hard question, actually. Probably golfing. Oh, oh, oh. Today I woke up at 8 a.m., went to the gym until 9 a.m., took a shower, grabbed coffee at Darden, went to class. Uh, it started 10. I was late as usual, 10-10, 10, 10. 10 minutes late. I, and I just came back from classes. I was going to change clothes, just go to play zooming. tennis. It's basically Darden Friday, so it's Thursday, so I'm done for the week. Uh, I'm heading out to the West Coast for a concert. <laughs> what concert is this? It's a Coldplay concert. <laughs> it was beginning oh, no. to sound like business school was the oh, absolute no. tits. The only problem was that one extremely boring thing kept coming up. What industry did you work in prior to your MBA? Uh, consulting. And what are you hoping to work in after your MBA? Uh, consulting. Now, what are you hoping <laughs> to get out of this MBA program? Uh, hopefully a job in consulting. <laughs> I would be going into consulting. He's tall. What clubs are you a part of? I respect him for his height. Club, and the second one is a community consultant of Darden. So I'm going into consulting, but specifically for nonprofits and philanthropists. What industry did you work in prior to Darden? I was doing consulting before. Got it. And are you hoping to enter consulting after the I MBA am. program? Yeah, a different type of consulting. I used to do financial services consulting, and now I will do strategy consulting. Mark, where did you, what did you do before business school? I was a consultant. And what do you hope what to do? What is consulting? After? It's like, let's say you're a business that, I don't know, sells fucking tires. <laughs> let's say you're Goodyear tires and you think that you don't understand how to modernize for new technology or you don't understand how to fire people because <laughs> you have a lot of people to fire. Then you go to a company called McKinsey <laughs> or one of the big consulting companies and you say, please write me a get over worked underpaid grad students to write me a PowerPoint uh, about why I should fire half my staff. <laughs> and then uh, they make it and they charge you an absurd amount. And then you have a consultant that told you to do this so you can be like, well, I have to do it. Um, that's Consultants are just c companies that work for other companies and give them advice on how to do things. A lot of companies, especially for, for firing, for example, a lot of companies will know they have to fire people, but don't want to say that themselves. So they'll spend a lot of money hiring an outside consultant to milk them dry uh, for a long time until they say, yeah, you got to fire people. And then they do. That's, I'm, 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 again, I'm oversimplifying it. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some cons good consultant somewhere, but in general, it's a pretty predatory, bad industry. I feel like they are often wrong, they often tell, are wrong or obvious, and they just bleed companies dry, bro. I think they, um... After business school. Uh, definitely not consulting. <laughs> Finally, some diversity. Thanks, Mark. But I had to know, what was it about business school that prepared these people for a world in consulting? What were some of the skills that you learned during your time here at Darden that you think are going to be applicable to this new job um, in consulting? Being able to say something that sounds like you know what you're doing when maybe you don't. Part of this is <laughs> learning how to give an answer. That is what it is. That is what it is. Because I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let's say you are, you know, you're like a 30 year veteran of this tire, I'm using a tire company, just cause it's, maybe you make auto, auto glass. It's the company, a company that makes and does something. And then you're like, you're getting some grad student, some, some kid straight out of school to tell you how to run your business. <laughs> and that kid almost certainly doesn't know tires like you do. They don't know shit, but you're paying them an absurd amount of money to be like, this is what you should do. Like you need to use the internet more or whatever. And almost always it's either basic or wrong. Right, so that, that's the problem with it. It's like, it just feels like it inherently, but at the end of the day, the only reason it exists is because of the either, I don't know, cowardice or, or just general fearfulness of these business owners. Like they have to pay McKinsey. They don't do it out of the goodness of their heart. They think they need the help and then they go out and it's like, they're not really getting the help, but 
Um, uh, they prey on a company's inability to look in a mirror. Exactly. Exactly. That's what it is. A company is afraid to do things like if they need to make layoffs or if they need to modernize their equipment or if they need to, or if they're losing. Like imagine they're just fucking, they're getting outcompeted. Like if you're good, your tires and Bridgestone is eating your lunch and you're like, what do I do? And you can't figure it out. Well, then it feels like you're doing something to go spend a lot of money on McKinsey. Even if they tell you just obvious shit. Or even if you know um, a quarter of the answer. It sounds like you had a bad experience with consultants. No, I didn't. Twitch and, and NVIDIA didn't use consultants, but like it was part of the culture at NVIDIA to shit on consultants. There's a very anti-consultant attitude at NVIDIA, which is like, we if we need consultants, it's fucking, then we're fucking stupid as shit. <laughs> So I, that is something like I was like, I was, I was birthed in or, or I don't know. That's what I was like. Um, and I think they had a really bad experience with consultants. Um, and it was like part of the culture there. So um, that is something that I like uh, have in my. We'll never give DNA a definitive whatever. answer because then you'll be held accountable for it. Trying to convince the client whatever you're saying is uh, the right thing to do. Indeed, consulting and other big buck industries like tech and finance are often what these MB baddies are aiming for. But the reality of tossing back so didn't you consult? I uh, I didn't I didn't consult and like work at McKinsey. After I quit Nvidia, uh, I would get these calls from people from these like like they're like. They're like, uh, what are they called? These kind of firms. Anyway, they're like, hey, we'll pay you $200 an hour to talk to somebody about your time at NVIDIA. And I was like, how can I possibly say no to that? <laughs> how can I possibly say no to that? And so there would be someone that calls you and they're just like, but all they did, I only did this like twice. And they would call you and they would literally want specifics on like how NVIDIA did things. <laughs> how many employees did you have for marketing? How many were on social? How many were on web? How many were on uh, email? How many were on, like, <laughs> how did you structure it? They just they just want to, they just want to copy. You know what I'm saying? And, and so that, it wasn't like they wanted my deep advice on anything. They were just like, how did NVIDIA do it? Uh, but again, all the information they asked for was pretty surface level. It was like, yeah, we had fucking eight employees that we structured it, whatever, like this department. Um, what is your mouse sensitivity, bro, please? please? Uh. Of Blanc at a Deloitte networking event is often less glamorous than one might think. What was the recruiting process like for consulting? We've heard that it's very fun. Fun is relative. So basically they'll come and they'll go to a winery and then you stand in a circle and then you try to talk to one person even though there's 10 or 15 of you and you try to get in one question and make an impression and then you send a bunch of emails and have coffee chats. Darkest time of my life. <laughs> so you say the same thing each time and you have to do literally a hundred if you're recruiting investment <laughs> banking. You say, hi, I'm Kiana from the Philippines. The reason why I did an MBA was this. The reason why I wanted to go into investment banking is this. And I love your bank because of this. And it's the exact same thing at each point. Now imagine doing that a hundred times. No, thank you. It takes uh, a lot weirder stuff than that to get me off. It was at this point that I realized talking to these silver tongue consultant hopefuls wasn't going to get me anywhere. I needed to go straight to the top. Instead of talking to the people who learned the lessons at business school, I was going to meet the ones who teach them. Beautiful day out. Business school professors. I don't know any myself, so I googled famous business school professors and found this guy. What's the point of business school? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a that genuine was... question? Yeah? Yeah. I have a theory of ties. When you realize they're a symbol of authority, and then you realize where they point, <laughs> you, you have to see them as decorative. <laughs> this guy's kind of wild. This, guy, this guy's kind of cool. What does he teach, bro? And, and what... What happens if they if they're looking? It's like crazy that Karl Marx is now a business school professor. <laughs> he kind of sold out. I gotta be honest with you. From his earlier days, I feel like he really. I mean, everyone's got to eat. I guess. Yes, is that? 
Well, I don't know what it says about what they're pointing to. Adam Grant is a New York Times bestselling author, organizational psychologist, serial TED talker, former magician, and current professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. And Ed Freeman is a professor at Darton who I think just made a dick joke. I think the point of business school is to teach people to be better at running businesses. Maybe. And by better, I mean Maybe. both more effective and also more responsible. Back in the day, I would say the focus of the MBA was on how to make money. I come along and I teach ethics, and that's a very small ethics. piece of it. Now, <laughs> it's a much bigger uh, part of the MBA. How have you seen business school evolve? I think in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, we actually saw far fewer bankers show up here. And we also saw fewer students want to become bankers. That means we have uh, probably a few more consultants. Consulting. Consulting. <laughs> consulting. <laughs> consulting. Also a lot more students going into tech and entrepreneurship, <laughs> but also a lot more public service, uh, which I think has enriched the classroom a ton. You mentioned it would be good to see less bankers, correct? I don't know that I want fewer bankers. I would like more bankers who are trying to figure out how to build a financial system that serves people as opposed to just saying, all right, More I want to become a banker and maximize my own income. I've had students walk into my office and say, my goal is to become as rich as humanly possible. Can you give me <laughs> advice about how to do that? Why is ethics necessary in, in, in business? And there's this At whole least story they're direct. of business. At least business they're direct. It's just about the money. It's just about money for shareholders. I tell people I teach business ethics. You know what they say. Uh, I didn't know business had any. Two words. <laughs> You put them together, oxymoron, like jumbo <laughs> shrimp. A uh, funny YouTube channel. I don't know. Um, you know, the typical this guy's person kind of who based. should be applying to business school. Who do you think that is? So I think a lot of the people who do apply are basically career enhancers. They both want to improve their credentials and also gain knowledge and build their networks to try to accelerate wherever they're climbing. I think business school is actually better for career switchers than career enhancers. Business school is a great way to reevaluate your options and spend two years learning, hopefully, and getting to know new people and then being able to pivot after that. The makeup of a business school class today, how has that changed? Well, I would say when I first started, it was mostly white guys. I could never <laughs> keep them all straight. They were all named Jim or Chip or an occasional Hiroshi. But now we, we have students from... Christ, 35 countries. Hey, or by the Japan thing, an occasional Hiroshi. He's doing, uh, he's 80s, bro. He's talking about more. I think when I got here, the class was hovering around 40% women for MBAs. And we hit 50% a few years ago and have maintained that ever since. So frankly, that was long overdue. I, I can't believe it took us that long. So we have more women. I guess by definition, that means fewer men. And that's a crisis. <laughs> uh, for whom? <laughs> You're gonna back me up here. <laughs> I definitely don't think that's a crisis. Right. That, that's what I meant. After chopping it up with the boys, I was feeling optimistic about the state of business school. But over the course of our investigation, reports were beginning to pile up, indicating that the momentum of top MBA programs might be coming to a halt. Jeff Pfeffer, a professor at Stanford's Pfeffer. Graduate School of Business, foresaw something like this slowdown over 20 years ago when he and Christina Fong published their article, The End of Business Schools. So we decided to fuck up some commas on Morning Brew's travel budget and meet Jeff at his house near Stanford University in California. Well, the state of business education is problematic. There are too many MBAs being produced. If you are a university and you looked around 20 or 30 or 40 years ago and saw the growth of MBA education and saw the MBA tuition is higher than the university tuition. Yeah, tuition is too say, high. This is a booming business. I can make a lot of money. And so you'd start business schools. And so there was a proliferation of the start of business schools. And so the market overshot. Unless you go to a top five or top 10 school, you're not gonna get much. You don't think it's not worth it? The difference between the students who go to the very elite business schools and the others is a huge, the difference in the placement is huge and gotten bigger. You need to go to a top business school and or else it's probably not worth the investment. So Jeff says there's so many MBA programs nowadays that it's only really worth it if you go to one of the best ones where you still stand a good chance of landing an elite corporate job. Scott Galloway, a media personality and professor at NYU Stern, told us more about the relationship between elite MBA programs and the companies that hire their students. Also, I'm realizing he looks like an exact combination of two other men from this very video. By the way, your apartment, your apartment looks like a hotel where someone goes to kill themselves, but just saying. What? 
What the fuck? The admissions department <laughs> is really the core competence of an elite school because what they say to corporations is, we've screened 2,000 applicants. We've forced them to interview, take tests, get letters of recommendation. We run a credit score on them, for God's sakes. So we're basically a giant HR department that corporations will pay a huge premium to get our pre -screened. Interesting way to think about it. And the customer in a business school is not the student. The student's the product. The customer is the corporation who's willing to pay an individual substantially more with that certification than they would pay that person pre-certification. So what's going on with business school? We got people trying to change careers, enhance careers, take a break from the grind and chill out for a couple of years. People consuming inordinate amounts of coffee while making small talk with KPMG employees. We got every flavor. That says my, my, my old boss at NVIDIA went to business school in New Orleans and he talks about it like it was the greatest two years of his life. <laughs> Did I mention this? He like, <laughs> well, the coffee cow, I get it, yeah. He, he, he like gets this far off look in his eyes that like he'll never have those two years again. Yeah, I think he went to Tulane. <laughs> and I guess he just fucking partied his fucking ass off, didn't do a single... Uh, consultant. We got people moving across the world to attend, and we got tons of people competing to get into a small group of elite programs. And if that all sounds gravy, then by golly, business school is right for you. Do you think that we should pursue an MBA? No, you guys are hopeless. <laughs> Just maybe not for me. <laughs> is that it? A place oh. where people go to that was great. That was great. Good, good video, Dan Toomey. I liked it. Good vibes. Uh, I like the Karl Marx guy. Uh, all right, boys. Yeah, we're going to watch House here. I think it's now the time. Uh, it's, it's fucking House time. Uh, so get your... This vexes me, Foreman. Every episode. House Knight Returns. Do 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 do. Get your legs hurting and your bingo boards ready. We are going to watch House MD. I'm going to run a quick ad and play the song. Everyone go get their snacks and drinks. And then we're going to watch uh, season six, episode seven, maybe? Link to bingo, please, for the chat. Ooh, this is no wait, let's find out what year it is. November 8th, 2009. The number one song on the radio. Oh my god. What did she say? J -j 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 